This is Kyle Filson of Expanded Perspectives. Expanded Perspectives is an audio podcast where we focus on ancient history, alternative history, cryptozoology, UFOs, the paranormal, and all things bizarre. Please visit our website at www.expandedperspectives.com. Subscribe to the show on iTunes and here on YouTube. You can follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. If you like what you hear, please be sure to rate and write a review for us on iTunes. It really helps us out. Thanks again for listening. We hope you enjoy. Howdy, everybody, and thanks for joining us here again on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And joining me this time, I've got a new sidekick. It's Evil Kyle. It's El Wapo. Yeah, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I'm so glad we got to do this. Everybody's back. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. Everything was going great. Hope your Monday's going good so far. Kyle? What you been up to, man? You've been busy this weekend, I know. Yeah, man. Friday, we went to the state fair with the kids, and we had a good old time. Oh, man. Oh, man. Weather was nice, so you really can't hate yeah, on that Yeah, the weather stuff. was perfect. It was like a high, like, 80. Right? It's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. It cost more than I like to spend. I mean, I mean, corn dogs <laughs> right? are like six dollars a throw. Uh, Cotton candy is like five a throw, and the rides are about five or six dollars a piece. Fr- fried cheesecake, everything over there they got fried. It's amazing. I, you know what? I'm not hating on that. I like fried foods. I mean, look at me. I mean, come on. Well, it's a southern thing. That's right. That's well. It's an anything. anything Let's fried. be honest. It wouldn't be very much fun to go to a fair and just eat like Whole Foods and organic, would it? Uh, no. It, well, you could have stopped. It wouldn't be fun to go anywhere and eat just Whole Foods and organic. I mean, come on. I mean, don't get me like wrong. That? I like to eat healthy. Yeah. I like natural stuff, but man, when you go to a fair, you just want to eat junk food, ride rides, uh, play the carnival fair, you know, like the the little games where you like try to hit a frog onto a lily pad and you spend like $20 and you win like a $2 An stuffed eraser. animal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the kids, they they love it. So I, yeah, we had a good time. I try to force diabetes on myself with all the cotton candy and things that I can eat and drink. Oh, I saw some people over there that looked <laughs> like they were one or two fried Twinkies away from an explosive heart attack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't help it. The food's awesome. Folks, thank you so much for... For, they're always coming back and joining Kyle and I here, and uh, you got me. I, I didn't know, and I didn't know until after we recorded it, and we were busy, and I was pulling down stories. Kyle, you've seen it. The shark story, man, it didn't it didn't pan out. It's not real. It's not real. I didn't know that when I did it. I looked well, at the world thing, and I was like, man, that's so awesome. I wanted it to be real, folks. Thank you. I literally got close to 200 Private messages, emails. <laughs> I was inundated with information going, hey, dummy, you know, it's not. And I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I wanted it to be real. I didn't know it wasn't real at the time I did it. I had a sneaking suspicion that it may not have been, but it happens from time to time. We well, always talk about it. It yeah. happens from time to time. It got us. Unfortunately, when you're doing a show on esoteric and fringe topics, uh, you run into stories that aren't real. And uh, that happens a lot. I mean, there's so many times where I'm doing research. Man, this is a kick, but awesome story but and yeah. then halfway through it you're like man it's not real self destruct start over you find another cool story you start getting into it nope it's not real <laughs> so, I mean, it happens a lot yeah but that's the hardest part i mean when you're trying to come up with you know cool really out there topics and stories you run into a lot of that yeah sometimes you, f- you filter it out as best you can sometimes you win sometimes you lose but Thank you, everybody that, res- that sent yeah. us stuff. Thank at least we have so a lot much. of people keeping us on the straight and narrow. Yeah, at least you're and, like, uh, hey, man, it's, you know, it's not like, yeah, man, thanks. I know I've, it was one of those deals that I didn't look into it enough. I like the story so much because it plays off the idea that I'm still not getting in the water. I think I even talked, I tweeted somebody about that as I, I wanted it to be real, but it's still, 
I'm still not getting the water, even though it's not real. Oh, I saw the flood of emails and stuff coming in, and I was I wasn't surprised that Cam screwed up. I was just disappointed that it wasn't real. I was like, man, I wanted that to be real. Right? It'd be neat to have a parent of megalodon, yeah. a gigantic, five times larger than a great white shark patrolling the waters. To me, that's a really cool idea. Now, don't be surprised, as I emailed one of our listeners. Uh, that you'll probably see something mentioned on Shark Week next year. You're probably right. That's right. I mean, yeah. that's their thing. Yeah. These stories are circulating. They're going to use it. I didn't think about that. There'll You're be some scientist right. from Pakistan talking about the sighting yeah. of this shark, you know, and it'll be an actor pretending to be a scientist right. as usual. Son of a gun. Ah. Anyway, folks, thank you so much for keeping us on the straight and narrow and keeping it on the up and up. Uh, Kyle, why don't you tell everybody who we got joining us this week? Yeah, tonight we're going to be interviewing Linda Godfrey. Now, Linda Godfrey's been on our show before. It was almost a year ago, the last time she was on our Halloween special, mm-hmm. we were talking about one of her books. Um, now, she's a specialist mainly in upright canids, yeah. uh, dog men and stuff is really how she made her mark. Uh, but this new book she's got coming out, and it's out now, it just came out, is American Monsters, A History of Monster Lore, Legends, and Sightings in America. And we talk with her about that tonight. And it's really, it's a really good book. It's broken down into three categories, Monsters by Land, Monsters by Sea, Monsters by Air. And it's got all types of cryptids. I mean, it really is cool. I mean, you got not just the Jersey Devil or Mothman or the typical yeah. ones. Uh, you've got Florida Gator Man. You got mermaids. You got native water spirits. You got she dragons, American gargoyles. I mean, just crazy stories, along with dogmen. So I found it really interesting. Now, if you're not familiar with Linda, she's a she's a nationally recognized author, an award winning journalist, an investigator of mystery creatures. She has researched hundreds of cases, beginning back in 1992 with her first news story, The Beast of Bray Road. She later wrote a book on it. She's been featured on Monster Quest, Monsters and Mysteries in America, Sean Hannity's America, Inside Edition, Lost Tapes, Haunted Highway, and many other TV and radio shows. She has published over 15 books on strange creatures, eccentric people, and unusual haunted places. She lives with her husband in Lhasa Apso in rural Wisconsin. You can visit her website, lindagodfrey.com. Yeah. So stay with us after the break, folks, and we're going to get into it. This is Expanded Perspectives. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest tonight, a friend of the show. We've had her on once before, uh, Miss Linda Godfrey. How are you doing, Linda? I'm great, thanks. Now, we just got your newest Back book. <laughs> we just got your newest book, American Monsters. And I have to tell you, I really enjoyed it. It's a full compendium of all types of mysterious creatures. And I really like the way that Thank you me. have the book broken up. You're welcome. I love the way you have the book broken up into sections like monsters by air, monsters by sea, monsters by land. It makes it real easy to kind of navigate through there and pick and choose which stories you want to read if you don't want to read it cover to back. It's really neat. Now, I want to start with monsters by air. And I was really fascinated. Mm-hmm. I was really fascinated with uh, some of the stories about dragons and even gargoyles. Can you tell us anything about uh, what you found when it comes to dragons or gargoyles? Yeah, and, you know, I, I first have to say that there isn't any one hard and fast description that I could find of what exactly is a gargoyle or what exactly is a dragon, but I kind of went by what the witnesses had to say about it. And I was surprised that there were so many people who described what they saw as gargoyles or dragons, you know, because some seem a little bit more reptilian, 
Um, some definitely fly. Some people describe something as a gargoyle but didn't necessarily see wings. Um, but, for instance, there's what I call the Toma gargoyle because this happened in the Toma, Wisconsin area, about the center of the state. And what she saw had sort of a characteristic kangaroo body shape that was sort of like what people describe the chupacabras, which is somewhat in the same category. And she saw it outside one night standing about 25 feet away from her dog on the other side of her car. And she said, when I opened the door, it turned its head toward me, really creepy, had this weird yellow eye shine. I saw the upper body, smaller arms sticking out in front, uh, upper torso, brown-colored fur, like deer brown during the heat of summer. It had a bony-looking head, kangaroo-like ears, a thin neck, was not a deer, dog, goat, anything I could think of, and I don't think it was a kangaroo either. And she just described its whole body shape and structure as reminding her of one of those medieval gargoyles that you would see crouching on the outside of cathedrals and other types of important buildings around medieval Europe. They were actually meant as, as guardian figures, but, you know, we think of them as something a little more negative now. <laughs> but she said that it was on two feet. That was the one thing that really uh, stopped her thinking about this. And then there's another one, my, Fred, my friend uh, Chad Lewis, and uh, well, and two other friends, Noah Voss and Kevin Nelson, investigated and uh, actually wrote a book on the Van Meter Visitor, which is in Van Meter, Iowa. And this was a thing that emerged from a mine in this tiny little town in autumn of 1903, and actually sort of took over the downtown area of this little little uh, village and terrified people. And they described it as half human and half animal with large membranous wings, a blunted horn growing out of its forehead, which kind of reminds you of uh, the Jersey Devil was sometimes described like that. Um, it was invincible to bullets, which is something that's often ascribed to uh, other better-known upright creatures. And it also uh, leaped like a kangaroo. When it ran, it was on its hind legs. It was estimated at eight feet tall, but this had kind of bat-like wings, and there's actually a pair of them. So, And, and the horn uh, emitted light at night, so it had a sort of bioluminescent quality to it. And then there were dragons, descri- described as dragons by a whole family from Oconto Falls, which is a very tiny little town near Green Bay, Wisconsin, home of the Green Bay Packers, trying to get that in. Um, but this was... Um, a, a young man who was at a, an outdoor concert, and he's with his friends, and they were watching, lying outdoors watching the sky afterwards and saw these creatures fly over. And he said, after about 15 minutes of talking and laughter, these emotions changed to surprise and astonishment as we watched a massive white-slash-tan dragon fly over the clouds. We knew it had to be a dragon because how else would you describe something flying over that was almost silent, larger than a plane, and had a tail, bat-like wings, long neck, and a narrow pointed head and scales. Now, as I said, this is a small town, and he ran home and got his mother and his sister to come out and look at it, too, and they were making fun until it came back overhead going in the opposite direction. And there were smaller ones flying with it, too. They couldn't get as good of a look at it as this one, and uh, they said this one was close enough that they could see the street lights illuminating its underside and see that it had scales on it, not feathers, but scales. And the um, the mother, I interviewed the mother separately. I interviewed um, the sister separately. They all described it. Uh, the mother actually drew a kind of an outline type sketch that I've got in in the book. And um, they described it also as having a snake-shaped head, a long pointed tail. Um, the sister said, I don't care what the scientists say, it was not a pterodactyl. I could see it had pearly pale scales. And they saw what she called a fireball of some sort coming from its mouth. What? Now, there are people who... <laughs> pardon? Oh, it's like, that's incredible. That oh. Man, I mean, you hear people talking yeah. about pterosaurs and stuff, but they definitely thought that this was a dragon. That's incredible. Right, and it was the entire family. I interv- as I said, I interviewed them all separately and reviewed the interview. You know, it was first reported to me a few years ago, 
and I went back and double checked and are you sure and, and actually got the extra interview with the sister that I hadn't had before. You know, they all still swore by it, described it the same way. Um, but there's there are investigators that believe there are sort of scaly looking or almost prehistoric looking large flying things that we might relate to the pterosaurs or pterodactyls. In Africa they're called Kongamato and um, he likes to call them the Ropen, and he also has attributed a bioluminescent quality to uh, the, the what he calls the Ropen in Papua New Guinea, where he's gone, and uh, Jonathan Whitcomb is his name, he's gone and, and done some studies. So we've got sightings of these same types of things around the globe. Um, a number of people are attributing fireballs or bio, bioluminescence or glowing um, ability to them, and I think that's pretty strange <laughs> and outstanding that we have a number of, of witnesses from completely different backgrounds and areas reporting basically the same thing. Yeah, I, I agree. It's incredible. I've, now, I've read stories uh, about the Ropin uh, and also Paul Nation uh, done some studies on the Indava bird, which is also uh, like a pterosaur. But I wasn't aware that mm -hmm. there was some near Green Bay like that. You know, I've never heard of that story. That's That's amazing. I mean, they definitely saw it. By the streetlights, they could tell it had scales. Uh, they knew it was dragon. And I, I think it's interesting that they mm -hmm. had little ones uh, flying with it, like it was a mother dragon with her little flock tagging behind. That's an incredible story. And the Van Meter uh, right. monster you were talking about, didn't they uh, chase? Weren't those things living like an abandoned mine or well or something? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a mine right at the edge of town. And that was, uh, you know, where it came from and where they, when it did, um, you know, leave, leave the downtown now and then, that's where it would go. And then when it finally made its final exit, they heard that, first of all, the people heard strange sounds coming, and then they saw two of the creatures exiting the shaft. And both of them were emitting this uh, glowing light. So, and one was slightly smaller than the other, so they you know, figured that it must be the mate or something. Hmm. They did come back that morning about sunrise. Um, and again, they tried to fire at them. And I thought this was interesting, too, because they said the, the creature's response was that they kind of skunk-like released a putrid odor that had previously been smelled by some of the downtown businessmen. So it had this, um, you know, odor release as, as a defense. Hmm. That That's... I love those stories. I love all the, the flying humanoids and the dragons and, and gargoyles and things. Um, and, and even the regular big birds, I think. I was fascinated to find out really how many sightings of those there had been, you know, and, and how endemic they are in cultures worldwide. The legends that there are these giant birds still existing in, in the time of man. Well, Linda, I wanted to ask you, after going through all these stories, did you seem to find a place that seemed to... Is there, I guess, an area, like a, a set number of states or a set east or north or south or west, an area or, that seems to have more sightings than any of the others? Is, or does it seem to be pretty much evenly spread out through the U.S.? Um, you know, I, I do think that there are some areas that seem richly blessed with unknown creatures, and especially the, the flying ones, especially um, Pennsylvania. You know, you wouldn't think that that would be a den of unknown creatures, but it really is. Um, lots of the flying creatures there. And Texas is the same way. Um, I'm thinking of New Jersey. <laughs> you know, it has the Jersey Devil and, and all kinds of other weird things. Um, West Virginia seems to be that way. Wisconsin has lots of lots of cryptids, lots of, um, you know, the dog man and really quite a few Bigfoot, more than most people realize, too. So there do seem to be states here and there that are, you know, what John Keel called window areas, or just maybe they've got the perfect habitat. Um, I've often wondered if Pennsylvania has so many because it, it's in such a perfect crossroads place. You almost have to go through it if something is trying to get from one coast to another or, you know, heading up northward from, um, you know, this middle and south america that sort of thing it's it's sort of on the way and it's got all these fabulous deep forests for things to hide in 
Well, I know that you brought up Texas because it's those are kind of like some stories that Kyle and I have kind of grown up on. There's a lot of these. You were talking about the Thunderbirds is West Texas and Southwest Texas. It's very uninhabited. It's very almost the way it was a couple hundred years ago, just vast kind of rough, dry, mm-hmm. rugged country. So there's plenty of areas for things like that to to kind of hide out and stay, I guess, hidden if it really wanted to. Yeah, and you know, and I think there's more of that kind of terrain around the entire country than, than people realize. I mean, human population really is so much denser in cities and, and, and we're all so citified and and yes there's more and more habitation of the wilderness now than there used to be but um, you know I, I think there's there's still quite a few places where things could get around and not be seen unless they wanted to in most cases I mean even think of the swamps you know in the south where, where people just don't go because it's just too rough other than reality TV shows but <laughs> um, I, no, I, I I agree. There, Texas, Texas is a very good spot. Well, and and moving on uh, to an, another section of the book, monsters by the sea or of the sea. I really liked that chapter, especially because I've never really read that many as many stories that are as compiled in your book about mermaids and like Native American water spirits. And I even like in the beginning of the chapter, uh, you start off talking about the mermaid show that the Discovery Channel or the Animal Planet put out like two years ago, and I agree with you. I wasn't, it wasn't so intriguing, the actual show. What was intriguing was how many people sh- uh, turned up to watch the show. I mean, there were several million people that right. seemed to be interested in the mermaids, and I thought maybe I was just one of the only people that actually liked them. Can you tell us any neat stories that anybody gave you uh, concerning mermaids or these Native American water spirits? Well, you know, um, the... The mo- the real modern stories of encounters with mermaids um, are kind of few and far between. And this is one where, I mean, if I wanted, to, I decided if I wanted to make the entire range of creatures uh, av- available in, in the the book, I was going to have to, in some cases, go to other people's research. And that's kind of what I had to do uh, with this one. Um, but starting with the Native American lore, they believe tons of different things lived in the water and very, very widespread across uh, many of the indigenous nations are believes in small humanoid water beings that live either in or near the bodies of water and they can be sort of beneficial but they're considered mischievous and that they can be, uh, they can turn quite evil if they're disrespected or mistreated. And if you go up to the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of traditions of seals that shapeshift and interact with humans and intermarry with them. Um, and, and this is kind of wherever you've got seals, maybe it's because of the way they, they sit up on, on the water um, or, or warmer areas where you've got manatees, for instance. They're also often connected with mermaids, although I point out they don't look anything like the beautiful mermaids that modern people are in love with you know, <laughs> yeah. and make into wonderful Disney movies. But, um, you know, they've, some of the better sightings have been seen around uh, Russia where there have been incidents where they, um, you know, followed fishing boats and were supposedly seen by, there was, and in the Caspian Sea off Iran in March and April of 2005, um, people were, fishing boats were spotting what they called a merman, and they were saying that it was swimming a parallel course near the boat. And in the beginning, they thought it was a big fish, but then they saw it had hair, and it, instead of fins, it looked like it had arms, and it was muscular, um, about five and a half feet length of regular you know, human height. And they could see the fingers were webbed, however, and that it had gills. So... Um, yeah, there's there's quite a tradition of of mere, merfolk or, or merfolk, however you want to pronounce it. But um, I did think that that you know we, there are lots and lots of reality shows where there are reenactments of incidents that people will claim uh, that they saw, you know, and attest to. And of course, you you can't go back and and film the real incident as it happened, so you make a reenactment. This one went a little farther beyond though because. 
Um, it was just really, if you read the fine print, billing itself as entertainment and using, whereas other shows will bring in actual scientists to testify and give their information. If Again, if you read the fine print, you'd see that the scientists on this show were actually actors <laughs> yeah. who were you know, just follow, following a script. So I, I do think it's fair to say that this one went a little above and beyond. Um, you know, some people call it a mockumentary because it's a mock documentary of something. Well, when you were talking about the humanoids in the water, one of the stories in the book that I liked so well was uh, the one that took place in the Florida Keys in 1905. The creature sighting that they had down there then where the the men actually was using binoculars could get a clear look of, at it and still didn't know what they were looking at. Yeah, you find, and Florida is, is one of these states. You probably noticed um, because I devoted quite a large amount of, of uh, space to it, Chapter 11, The Florida Gator Man. Mm-hmm. And that, that to me is a really, really remarkable story because the person who reported it, and I, and I checked him out pretty thoroughly and um, interviewed him at great length a, a number of times and actually asked him to sign a statement um, of verification, you know, that that he was, in fact, um, you know, telling me the, the story as he understood it in a factual way and that the events really occurred, you know, because I, it was so extraordinary. I just wanted to make sure I took those extra steps. And he's actually a volunteer at a Florida Paleontology Museum, and he's in college already uh, working on uh, paleontology and, and zoology, hopefully with, with doctorates, and wanted to stay anonymous because he thought that it might adversely correct, or excuse me, adversely affect his future career if this got out. But his um, he lives on the St. John's River, and the majority of his work is on this a very long riverway. It flows on the eastern side of Florida, and it's known for its manatees. And uh, in fact, it's uh, it was famous earlier for um, what, a mo- what they were calling a monster. It was a, a pink dolphin known as Pinky that was seen around in, in various areas. <laughs> but he was working around working with uh, alligators and things like that. When he began to notice, he started at first seeing weird slide marks. He'd see manatees, um, all bitten up like manatees never usually are because they're so leathery and so large. Things mostly leave them alone. Um, he was just seeing, uh, he- hearing something huge drop in the water, seeing part of a figure, a blackish figure, standing under cypress trees, ducking down in the water. And then... He finally got a really good look at it when he saw it on shore one day, and it was watching him, and it stood up. And he realized it looked like a gator, but not any sort of gator he'd ever seen, not a modern gator. Its head was bigger and more like an extinct form of gator that had a much more rounded dome-shaped head than the flat one that you see on, on today's gators. And also... It had longer, stronger arms and legs, whereas, you know, the typical uh, alligator of today, if you look at their legs, they're sort of puny compared to their bodies. They're meant for swimming and for, you know, crawling up on the mud banks. These were big enough that it could stand up on its hind legs, and its arms were longer and more developed. And this thing, um, you know, dove in the water and started following around. And um, it actually... It caught him on a kayak at one time, and that was um, really creepy to him. It had the bumps on its back, you know, that he knew was was made by the um, the shape of the the not scales but shoots, I think they're called on on its back, and uh, actually made him get out of the water from when he was on his kayak at one point. Um, since then, it has actually followed him home. He has seen it at its dock. Um, I liken it to the story of Peter Pan where Captain Hook was being followed by that alligator with <laughs> with the clock in its stomach, you know, <laughs> kicking away. Yeah. And, yeah, it, I mean, it attacked him when he was in a bigger boat with a friend, you know, was swimming. He was um, actually afra- afraid that it might be able to come partly through one of the portholes and, and get at him. So it's an, a very odd story, very scary to me. And I have to say that 
I've heard the same sorts of witness reactions and thoughts about other types of creatures, uh, for instance, the dog man or, or Bigfoot, where people have felt like they were followed home, even um, the flying man bat um, of La Crosse, um, where people have felt the creatures followed them, knew where they lived, sort of harassed them in a way, you know, for a while, and had this uncanny sense that the creatures were interested in them particularly, you know, unlike normal animals, where if you run into a bear in the woods, you might be afraid of it because it could certainly, um, you know, hurt you, but you wouldn't necessarily think that it had picked you out as an individual and was going to follow you home and bam on the side of your house and, you know, um, just just keep at it with you. And I find that a really strange common denominator between these, these very different types of creatures that show up in very different geographical areas. Yeah, I, and that's that's terrifying because the the alligator man. Uh, most alligators, I think, aren't aren't very aggressive unless you're messing with their nest or anything. I mean, this thing's pursuing him, and on several occasions right. it's pursued him. So that's weird that it's aggressive. And like you mentioned with the dog man, uh, most people when they've had their encounters, they have the feeling like it wants to do harm to them, which is what's so scary. Right. You know, not just the menacing right. look. And had... Exactly. Yeah, and. And you don't always hear that from Sasquatch. A lot of people who see it feel that it's, you know, more benign or that it's curious or that it just would kind of like them to go away. But um, this thing, you know, really more like the dog man or some of these flying things that that just seem very, um, very aggressive and very tuned in on a personal level to the eyewitness, which is, is I think, what really shakes them more than anything else. There's, it's almost like it's trying to make a connection, and uh, the eyewitness doesn't want that connection. Well, you're right. I mean, it's one of those things that usually when you hear the stories of, of Sasquatch or Bigfoot sightings, lots of times it's almost as much as them watching you as you are watching them. But mm-hmm. with most of a lot of the stories in the book and other stories that Kyle and I have researched, like you said, it's almost like they sense your fear. They know that you're uneasy, and that's something that they find pleasure in. So they kind of linger around and mess with you. Like, well, I mean, even the whole idea of, of something like that following you home, that's a terrifying idea. I mean, Kyle and I always make the joke that yeah. the reason we don't get involved with any paranormal research groups and go out and do it is we don't want something paranormal following us home. <laughs> and it, Bigfoot's not going to follow you home. Right. And Bigfoot may not, but that doesn't mean some of these other creatures may not follow you home. But you bring up a really good point, which is that among paranormal researchers, and by that I'm talking about mostly the people who, um, you know, look for haunted haunted houses and, and spirits of different kinds, um, it's very commonly accepted in, in those circles that the things can and will follow you home. These, these spirits, um, you know, can, can attach themselves to you and even be attached to furniture or... Um, objects that you might get. John mm-hmm. Zaffis has made that point on, on his TV show a lot. So to see that sort of thing happening with these strange animals, um, you know, I think it's very disconcerting. And you can understand why there's this uh, sort of argument in two camps as to whether these creatures are just normal flesh and blood things like bears or mountain lions, just something that's not seen much, or something that um, has another, let's say, vibe to it, for lack of a better term. Well, I know that in your, your, your book about the dog men, and even in the stories in here, it's it never seems like those sightings are friendly at the least, or it's never, I mean, e- even tales that, that we've heard from other people that's that's not been published, even certain stories, it's never like, oh, well, I saw them and they saw me and we just ended up watching each other or I watched them come out in a little opening and everything and they were real laid back and cool. It, it's almost like every sighting involves something evil, involves evil intent or an evil feeling that you're getting from this creature. Yeah, most of them. I mean, there are a few exceptions. There, I mean, there was the woman who got lost in a uh, forest in Hawaii and just finally laid down in the in the nighttime in the bush and uh, was about ready, felt like she was going to die and would never find it. And this um, pack of kind of wolf-like dogs surrounded her and warmed her up and then 
kind of set her off in the right direction in the morning and she felt they rescued her. But was that, I mean, it's very easily um, conjectured that maybe that was more of a, 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 because she was in a very bad situation where she was cold and scared and probably hungry. And, you know, you, you can imagine somebody having a hallucination in that case. But um, most of the time, it's that they're really scared and they feel that the creature could or would do them harm and that they don't want to be involved with it. Well, those were just sweet Hawaiian dogs. I mean, every, <laughs> you figure every animal in Hawaii is happy. Of course it's going to help out. Right. <laughs> it's extremely helpful. Yeah. Now, did you get, yeah, so. uh, in all your, when you were gathering these stories and all this stuff, have you had any that you maybe didn't get a chance to publish? or that some that you just haven't, you know, that you received after the book had already gone to, to print? Oh, sure. Yeah, I I receive sightings quite frequently. I, I usually get, oh, one, or, one to three a week. Um, wow. More of the dog man, but I get, I, I, get, I get Bigfoot and weird birds and, you know, other indescribable things, too. So, yeah, I, I receive sightings regularly. And it was, of course, um, these larger publishers take like a year to publish the book. So I had the manuscript in um, close to a year before it was able to be published. And I did stick a few extra things in there, you know, (laughs) that I was able to insert. But, um, yeah, I've gotten some really, really interesting things since then. So um, I I have crazy files. Does it seem like the dogmen sightings are, are on the rise? Um, I don't know if exactly the sightings are, but I think the awareness of them is. You know, people are more aware because of my books that I'm here collecting these things. Other people are getting um, are, are beginning to actively solicit the the sightings, and um, you know, I, I know Lon Strickler has quite a few, and uh, Stan Gordon in Pennsylvania has quite a few, and there are others. And so I I think that more people are aware, more people feel okay about telling the stories, the more other ones come out, and uh, more people are collecting the incidents. So I think that's bound to draw more reports out. Have you got any good creepy ones that you didn't publish that you'd share with us? Well, there's one that... um, I thought was was really really strange to him from from North Carolina that was different, very very different. And people who like to say these things are all only flesh and blood animals are probably going to be driven nuts by this one. But um, this this was an invisible thing where he was watching and listening something walking past him, and could hear it, could see the footprints, and not see the creature. And um, he was. This happened 15 miles west of Charlotte, just across the Catawba River from the city. And he was out out there in the country. And there was this one area of woods that was always dark that they called the Spooky Woods. You know, and he, he and he said, "I'm a church person. I can put my hand on the Bible. What I'm going to tell you is the truth." And um, in the Spooky Woods, he'd go hunting in it once in a while, but he never shot anything because there weren't any animals. And a friend of his wanted to go, and he said, I, I told you, you can, I told him you can come and hunt, but you won't see anything. You know, no birds even fly over it. Yeah. Um, a lot of members of his family wouldn't go in it. Um, it was once inhabited by the Catawba Indians, but nobody, um, you know, nobody ever got anything. They would hear sounds like a woman screaming in there, and everybody was basically scared. So they went in about 1.30 in the afternoon when it was sunny, And he suggested they walk into where he knew there were some power lines near some blackberry bushes because he thought that might be a good place to kind of hunker down and look and see if there was anything. So they were walking on this old logging road when they start hearing somebody walking up behind them in the woods maybe 15 to 20 feet away on two feet. And his friend said, who is that? Not what is that, but who is that? Because it sounded like a human. And he said, we stopped, they stopped. We stopped, they stopped, and they were getting freaked out. It was autumn, so it was, you know, the leaves were sort of crunchy. So he had this idea that they would get all the way to the power lines where there was a kind of a big opening, 
in the undergrowth and then quickly turn around and see who was there. So they did that. And as they turned around, the steps kept coming toward them. They heard the steps leave the woods and were walking through the clearing right next to them. He said, it was so close, I could have reached out and, and touched it, but it was invisible. They could see the leaves crunching. They could hear the leaves crunching, but there was nothing that they could see. And he said, I, I never had a thought of raising my gun. I was like in a daze. And they both, he said, both the men felt that way, like it was they were somehow zoning out during this time that it was crossing the clearing right next to them. Now, this man has worked in city management. Um, he's a school teacher, and he's uh, and he says there are a lot of the Bigfoot seen around uh, the Catawba River, but that's the only other um, anomalous thing that he knows about the area. Now, how do you explain that? That is an extremely unsettling story to know that something out there that you can't see but could possibly knows you're there. Yeah, that's, I don't know what that right. is. And it's not just the fact and that, that they heard it. sort of incapacitate you. Yeah. And, and especially that it sort of uh, incapacitated him. And all of his family got sick and got cancer. They all had to leave. They, they all finally moved from there. One neighbor committed suicide. I mean, all his neighbors either got cancer, got sick and died, or committed suicide. Man, that, that just sounds like an evil place that needs to be fenced <clears> off. <throat> yeah, that's that's terrible. Well, now that we're speaking about uh, yeah. encounters on the land, I guess that's the next section that we'll talk about. I like a, uh, your description of some of the unholy hybrids and other mammals. Uh, do you have any creepy stories or interesting stories about these hybrid, unholy hybrids? Well, you know, and I use I use the term hybrid loosely because I actually don't believe that you can create true frog people or true pig people or true, uh, you know, although I know there are pig parts used in, uh, in surgery. So in a way, you know, there are people who have, who have those in them, but, um, lizard people, you name it, goat people, just about any creature that you can imagine <laughs> has been called, um, you know, a uh, a strange hybrid, and there are lots of different theories. Some people think they're demons. Some people think they're actual results of secret experiments by government genetics labs. Right. Some people think that they're just inborn, inbred groups of humans that have mutated somehow, or um, groups that have mutated due to their environment, something like that. But what amazes me is, is that these sorts of communities are talked about all over the country and I know I know in Wisconsin um, there are three different areas in the state with legendary pig people and they're quite widely separated ones in Dark County ones kind of up north and then ones sort of in the southwestern part of the state and from what I can tell they all originate from different um, settler era legends and they're all probably urban legends Mm -hmm. is, is the other thing. And, okay. and the same thing happens with the goat, the goat man. Um, it, the goat men are frequently um, associated with um, Civil War era legends of uh, a creature that steals a, a bride away from a groom or a groom away from a bride and then haunts the area, um, you know, looking for other young couples on the roads, that kind of thing. So... I haven't, you know, and I even, I discuss like the the Montauk Monster and Goatman, things around Maryland, you know, where there's, there is a government facility, and you just really can't come up with anything concrete, unfortunately, with these things. That, it, it always leaves me, but every time I finish going through these stories, it always ends up leaving me, just like you said, it leaves me with more questions. But you're like, <laughs> yeah. like you just said, I mean, is it, is it yeah. old wives' tales? Is it folklore? Or was it based? Like, you know, because you always think it's based in something. There's got to be something that kind of led somebody down that path to start with. But, but like you right. said, there's no natural cross between these creatures and, and human beings or some sort of thing. It's a very strange, when they see have these sightings, you know, even like the Gator Man or any of those sightings, it's a very... I mean, it's almost like it was created ourselves, almost like a tulpa. 
It's almost like in our minds we've created it ourselves, and it's actually taken form right. just from the thought. Like that, a, right, like a thought form that, yeah. that has taken uh, material form and, and escaped. And some people think that's what they are. Um, there's another theory that, um, and, and I personally think this too, really just about any creature that's normally quadruped, quadrupedal, whether it's a, a, even a deer you know, or a bear or whatever, can walk on its hind legs. And I think that, and when people see something like that walking on the hind legs, we associate that trait with being human, mm-hmm. and we're more likely to call it, uh, you know, even with a dog man, a dog man, or, or a lizard man, or, um, you know, a bird man, or, or whatever, when really it isn't at all becoming human, it's just assuming a different sort of stance than it usually takes. And I think in many cases that's probably probably all that it takes to start a legend like that. That or or sometimes one uh, mutant animal. Sometimes you can have, I remember uh, a few years ago, or more, maybe it was 10 years ago, there was something making the rounds that was supposed to be um, a pig with, that was born with a human face. And it was just sort of a, more of a, um, a, a mutant or a misshapen or birth defect, you know, where it had a flatter face and mm-hmm. it just yeah. looked really different. You know, and you can imagine um, this happening in, in some rural area where there wasn't a scientist to say what it was, and, and they're, you know, oh, it's pig man. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I and love so the stories, though. I love them. I can never get enough of the stories. I do, too. They're very rich, you know. I mean, you can take them as folklore. You can take them as mysteries. You can take them as spirit animals or, or whatever, but the, the stories are real are, are really, uh, I, I think, a, a strong part of our uh, folk heritage, if nothing else. Well, Linda, there was one story I wanted to ask you about that really stood out to me, and it was in the first part of the book of the Monsters by Air. And it was, the, I believe it was called the Micmac Kulo. And I remember it so well because it was a Native American woman that had actually told the story, I believe, to you or had sent it in, and she was a security guard and had claimed that the creatures that she saw were like small humanoid like faces on owl bodies around three to four foot size owls. And that it, it kind of hits close to home because it instantly makes me think of the, the work done by Mike Cleland when he talks about some of the, the alien abduction uh, people that claim to have seen these large owls. And it, it was one of those ones that blew me away because I had never heard of this story. And it was one that didn't seem like it had tied to anything else. Yeah, it's it it actually is. I mean, you know, there's every kind of creature in Native American lore, um, but this one, you know, the, the Kalu or or Kalu or however you want to pronounce it, um, is sort of like bird people. I mean, it it, it really is. And and uh, yeah, this this woman who was a security worker on night duty saw what she called bird people that she described as four feet tall with a humanoid face but a bird-like body, um, bird-like nose, and she just thought of them as as the uh, bird people from then on. You know, and in native lore, um, these bird people could intermarry with humans. It's hard telling what they were. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you could find a a case, you know, the ancient alien researchers might find a a case with ancient astronauts, you know, you could you could put it in in so many different categories, but and the owls um, and the idea of owl people is is also another very prevalent idea. And the owl, if, if you read a lot of uh, abduction um, literature that's out there, the owl is often one of the animals considered a screen creature. Where, uh, and by that I mean where an abductee remembers being with a, not a uh, a gray alien, but an owl, a giant owl, or being taken by a giant owl. Um, that that is a very frequent occurrence with uh, so-called alien abductions. So, uh, yeah, these, these birds do have this sort of unsettling thing. I actually had a dream once about walking up upon some uh, people that I thought were I thought they were people, but then when I got there, I realized they were actually birds dress up like people and acting like people and it the dream was so shocking i've never forgotten it it's not and i'm not saying that i think it was real or anything like that 
I don't know what to make of it, but it was such a striking and strange dream that if you saw this in your waking hours, I can't even imagine how it might affect right. you. <laughs> for real. Right? Yeah. Well, folks, for everybody listening, when uh, it's been almost a year whenever we first talked to Linda, and off air that year ago, she shared something with Kyle and I that she didn't hadn't really told a lot of people about up until that point. And we had, when it was over, Kyle and I was like, man, one day, one day I wish Linda would publish it, would talk about it. Well, it just so happens in this book, in chapter 24, is she talks about it. Linda, would you mind sharing with everybody what we're talking about? Sure, I'd be happy to. And um, as I told you off air today, too, it it took me a while to decide whether I should put this incident in the book or not because I really liked the, you know, the books to be about other people's experiences. And I didn't want it to seem self-serving, and I left it up to my editor who, who thought I should absolutely leave it in. But I felt it was important after 22 years of urging other people to to share their encounters um, and then if I had something and held it back, it would make me sort of a hypocrite. So I, I felt like I really needed to do that. Mm-hmm. And it happened two years ago in an area um, not too far from the southern unit of the Cattle Moraine State Forest. This was in a private area where I've had permission to walk on trails. And um, the kettles, for people who don't know, are bowl-shaped quite large depressions that were left by the last glacier, and there are ridges between them. And they can be, um, you know, up to uh, 40, 60 feet deep, something like that, or or even more in some cases. Some are smaller, some are larger. And very from the very beginning, when I started uh, reporting the, the, uh, the Beast of Bray Road 22 years ago, I started getting reports from people about Bigfoot being seen around these kettles dating back to at least the 1960s and perhaps as far back as the 1930s. And many of them were multiple reports. They were daylight reports. They were from very reputable um, people, some that I knew, um, middle-aged professionals, fishermen, people who weren't mistaken, you know. So I I knew that there was a sizable uh, Bigfoot population, you know, within this certain area, but I had never thought about it being in this part. I I felt very safe there. In fact, it was a Sunday evening when I was just walking by myself. It was a spur-of-the-moment thing. I hadn't even taken a camera with me or anything like that. I just thought, oh, it's it's going to be, you know, I've got a couple hours of daylight. I'm just going to quick go have a good walk. And there were some houses dotted here and there, but I sort of, I knew the people. That's why I had the permission. And I knew they were gone. They were mostly weekenders and had left already for the week. So there was no one around. And I just happened to notice there were three saplings bent in an arch, and th- I knew that that was uh, considered a sign of Bigfoot, and it just suddenly occurred to me, I don't know why, that I should go walk over and bang on this one particular tree a couple times and just try some tree knocks, which I had not done. I just had never really thought that was probably an effective method you know, of, of uh, getting to see a Bigfoot, and, and I hadn't done it, but I just did. I, I went about 10 feet off, the trail I was walking on, banged it a couple times, and lo and behold, from down in the kettle that I was next to, a couple of tree knocks came back, and there was something very large moving around. There was so much foliage, I couldn't see what it was, and it was moving into a tree from what I could tell, and I, I knocked again, got two knocks back. This went on for about five minutes, and finally I thought, well, I'm going to give it one more try because... It's got to be either a human or a Bigfoot because you need an opposable thumb to hold a stick and bang on a tree. And I was not that far from the tree. I was thinking, well, I could run back if I needed to. You know, I just really wanted to see what it was. <laughs> curiosity so was getting the best at, of you. I, curiosity killed the researcher. Yeah, That's it right. could have. It was, it, you know, it was boneheaded. I didn't have anything with, I didn't even have a phone with me. So it was. They probably knew that somehow. They, I think, they could smell electronics. So, at that, there was a a huge oak tree that was growing up from near the bottom of the kettle, kind of on the side opposite to where I was standing. So it was maybe a few hundred feet away, and I was at eye level with this one big limb. And all of a sudden, there was this huge crack, like 
like in, like a, during an ice storm in the winter when a tree splits apart. But it wasn't the tree splitting apart. It was this one, I measured it later, 35 foot long, 7 to 9 inch diameter limb that was cracked away from the tree horizontally until it was pointing at me. When it was moved horizontally in a 45 degree angle and I couldn't see what was doing it because again, this was a living tree. It was not a dead falling apart tree. There was no wind, absolutely no wind. We hadn't had storms for weeks or anything like that. And then there was a second a second crack and something ripped it at that point entirely away from the tree. I could see where the brand new wood was twisted and bent and I knew, you know, that this wasn't um, just something that was ready to fall off. For, and if it had been, it wouldn't have gone horizontally first. Right. And it was dropped 40 feet, that 40 feet down to the bottom of this kettle. And at that point, I knew, but I just knew what it had to be. There was just nothing else that it would possibly or could possibly have done that. So at that point, I, I ran ran home. Took a little while. I ran home, called some friends who lived five minutes away. My friend Sandra and her daughter Natalie, and um, they rushed over to meet me there because I, it was starting to get dark, and I wanted to go down. I just had to see for myself that it wasn't like, um, you know, eaten up by woodpeckers or rotten or something. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't. When we got down there, it was fresh new wood. I have lots of photographic evidence, and moreover, we found hand rubs on. Uh, opposing sides of the limb where something would have had to have reached over and taken hold of it in order to twist it away from the tree like it did. I still have a chunk of the bark that was pulled away on one side, and they were sort of roughly mitten-shaped, nine-inch long um, bark rubs where the the fresh wood was underneath, you know. And then we noticed there was this huge, strong smell. Now, And we were down in the bottom of the kettle, and it was starting to get a little dark, and we were feeling very uneasy because I never smelled anything like this before. It was skunk-ish, but not like skunk, not as not not as uh, as quite as putrid, just musky like that, mm-hmm. and with with a few notes of other, you know, maybe some urine in there and something else. So we climbed back up the back of the of the um, kettle where it was easiest to get up, and we're standing on the ridge looking into an adjoining kettle. It's a formation that that runs for, you know, a couple of miles. And all of a sudden, my friend's daughter, who was standing farther to the left, screamed, and she saw it. And she she described it as striding. And she's not a believer. She's not into Bigfoot lore um, or anything like that. She's not wasn't widely read. She's 21 at the time, just recently married, um, just happened to be there, you know, it, it was pure quick. So while Sandra and I were craning our necks trying to see if we could see it too, oh, and also she described it as having light gray beige fur, which she she didn't know there was such a thing as what they call a blonde Bigfoot, uh, nor that I'd had other previous sightings reports of a Bigfoot with that color of fur in this area. And then it growled at us. Once it was out of sight, it growled at us. And that's when, you know, the hair went up on all of our necks and we just knew we had to leave because, <laughs> you know, it was just, it was something huge making that growl. Yeah. Something with a very large voice yeah. box and larynx and, and chest, you know. And and I've been back frequently. I have I have found um, two different, um, four, probably 15-inch footprints in the area, but in both cases they were on... They were shallow, and they were on a slope that was far too sloped for me to be able to. I, I got pictures, and they sort of show up, but I could not make casts because everything just ran, no matter how thickly I mixed it. Um, and and there have been lot, there have been other incidents. I, you know, I don't have time to go into all of them. But, <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I think they I think they forage. I I do believe that they one one or two. I think there are probably two, and that they forage around here. Now, because does... there's been a dark one seen also. Does that friend of your your or that your friend's daughter is she a believer now? Oh yes, <laughs> it, it changed yeah, her, I, mean, I suppose. She, she saw it. Yeah, it, it really, she was absolutely in shock, absolutely in shock, and um, you know never never expect. It, it's always the the total unbeliever that that gets to see it. You know, I I I don't know why that is. It is funny but, how it um, works out that way. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, bo- and both of them would swear to it, um, you know, in, in any incident. So be- between all all of those things, if I had just ended it with the branch falling and never went back down there and I didn't have the hand rubs and the footprints and the smell and the sighting, um, within quite close range, I might add, it was right down in the next kettle. When, and she only saw it for a, f- a, a few seconds as it ran behind another thick piece of foliage. But um, you know, but she saw it closely enough and well enough to say that it was larger than a human. And you know, was uh, she said it was it was the way it moved. It was not running. It was not walking. It was like striding. And that she didn't know, but that's how most Bigfoot. Uh, eyewitnesses describe their movement. It's this easy striding motion that they're able to ca- cover a lot of territory with one large step at a time. Man, well, thank you so much for sharing that with folks. Uh, wh- where can people find this book, American Monsters, A History of Monster Lore, Legends, and Sightings in America? It's by Tarcher uh, oh. Penguin. Uh, where's the best place people can get that? And Anywhere. It should be in any um, any bookstores and all, all the online bookstores. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you can go to the Tarcher Penguin website. Um, you can also go to lindagodfrey.com and find links for it there. Um, that's my that's my uh, blog and my website. You can there, There's a really eerie uh, recent dogman sighting in Heartland, Wisconsin, with a witness sketch that you might be interested in. Just scroll a few stories down. And I've been doing updates, and I've got another update that I'm, I'm actually – debating whether or not to put it on because it's uh, on the blog because it's just sort of so out there I can't even believe it myself. But, <laughs> but yeah, things continue to happen. And big bird sightings, because of that first chapter or, or first section of the book, mm-hmm. I've been getting really quite a few large bird sightings. Really? So, yeah, it's, it's just sort of amazing how this nice. uh, comes out. Well, do you yeah, have anything? I love it. <laughs> do you have anything else going on? Any lectures or book signings or anything else coming up in the next couple of months you'd like to promote? Well, um, if any of your listeners are around Michigan, I'm going to be giving a free presentation at the uh, Omer Michigan Library. You can find that and a link to it on the About page at LindaGodfrey.com next Tuesday um, on September 30th. I'm also going to be at uh, I'm going to be at the Beloit Library and the uh, Elkhorn Library and up in Eagle Waters Resort at Eagle River, Wisconsin, which is a really cool um, lakes area, almost up to the Paulding Lights. There will be an investigation into that too um, on the few days up to and including Halloween. So you can find all of that on the About page at LindaGodfrey.com. That will be perfect. Well, thank you so much, Linda, for coming on. Uh, We really enjoy your stories, and and we'll love to have you on again. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it very much. With expanded perspectives, Cam, what did you think of Linda? I, I, I love her. I really do. I mean, we've talked to her a lot off air when the first time we interviewed her, and I mean, we all hit it off as friends instantly. And then we've conversed with her numerous times, back and forth, back and forth, and then having her to come back on. She is such a sweet lady, and she really is a wealth of knowledge. She has so many stories sent to her. She, you know, she talks about some that's not in the book. She's told us stories. I mean, and I even brought up the fact it was really neat that she told us the story of her sighting that she had 
way before it was ever published, yeah, before she just right. kind of kept it hush us and asked us, you know, don't say anything about it. This is what happened to me. So I don't know. She's she's so likable. It's one of those ones. She's so sweet. I, I love listening to all. I could listen to her tell these stories and talk about all of her investigations for hours. Yeah. Every one of her books is really good. And this newest one is maybe her finest work. I loved it. Oh, yeah. It's packed full of stuff. I mean, people really no joke. If you like these kind of stories, the book is literally packed. Yep, with interesting stories. I mean, it's one of those. It's if you it's have a, a loved one that's in the cryptozoology, Christmas is coming up. American Monsters. You can find it on Amazon. I'll put links to it uh, on the show notes. And uh, don't forget, folks. Every Thursday, we do Expanded Perspectives Elite. So if you like this show and you're a fan of the show, whether you're listening on Dark Matter or iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you're listening to us, and you want another installment every Thursday, we do an Elite show. Signing up is easy. You can go to the website expandedperspectives.com. Look in the top right. You'll see a tab. Uh, click on that and signing up is very easy. Yeah. Five bucks a month, 55 bucks a year if you want to do it that way. I tell you what, Kyle, why don't you drop a little piece of it? Let them hear what it actually, a little story from one of those. Okay. Last week's show, I was talking about the Hopkinsville uh, encounter in Kentucky. Let's listen to that. Billy Ray Taylor went to an outside water pump for a drink. It was about 7 p.m., Taylor said, as he observed strange lights in the sky to the west, which he believed to be an unusual craft. The craft was disc-shaped in appearance and featured lights on the side of it that had all of the colors of the rainbow. He ran back to the house excitedly, telling the others about his flying saucer sighting, but no one believed him. You ain't gonna believe it! I just seen something weird fall out of the sky, a uh, bright light or something, I don't know what. It, it went lickety split across the field out there, and then it looked like it landed somewhere down in the gully. Instead thinking that he had become overly excited after seeing a vivid shooting star. At about 8 p.m., the families began hearing strange and unexplained noises outside. So there you go, see? Perfect. We do crazy stories. It's just like we said, we try to keep it exactly like this show, so if you like it and you just want more, well, there it is. It's always up there for us, so. Absolutely. Well, folks, if you have any stories of your own or anything you'd like to share or you'd like to bust, a, bust on us a little with some <laughs> yeah, of the false right? information, if we brought it up or not, or just tell us something you like, uh, don't forget you can email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. We also have a phone number. You can find us at 817-945-3828. You can call and leave us messages, and, and we'll play it back. Tell us how much you like the show. Tell us, you know, your own stories and things like that, and we'll play you back on the show, too. Yep, and you can follow the show on Twitter and Facebook. And, in fact, if you follow us on Twitter, uh, we tweet out stories almost every day yeah. of unusual topics that we often speak about on the show. Yeah, it's, it's a constant feed. We try to keep up with that whole deal and things like that, yeah. Well, I hope everybody has a good week. Don't work too hard. Stay out of trouble. And uh, if you're an elitist, we will catch you on Thursday. If yeah. not, we will talk to you next Monday. Everybody stay safe. Have a great weekend. Peace.